the intent from the beginning was to focus on the reality of genocide as it is happening currently in the first decade of the 21st century and as it can be traced back to the mandate period when the British authorities had control of a land area uh, that was about to import uh, thousands and ultimately millions of uh, Jewish people. I had done research in the Rhodes House archives at Oxford University looking for materials that somehow would explain what the intent of the Zionist group that Elam Papi calls the uh, Red House group in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, his book what their intent was when they were bringing over and working with, apparently, at least on the surface, the British government in Palestine to facilitate the entrance of these people into uh, the land area that Britain was in control of. And so I went to the Rhodes House Library with the intent of trying to focus on the months between the partition plan of November 1947 and the exit of the British Mandate government on May 15, 1948. The result of that research, approximately 500 pages of evidence that list information on six areas of uh, illegitimate activity on the part of the Jewish resistance movement against the British forces. They intentionally say that they will make it a British problem in Mandate Palestine if they do not act to fulfill the Zionist solution. I can read you sections of uh, the files here which amount to, in one section, uh, a threat, if you will, to the, uh, the British uh, forces and uh, let me read just a small section of this so that you have some idea of what we're talking about. We regard it, second page, number five, as our duty to caution you against any attempt to decide on an anti-Zionist solution and make good for it by an increased grant of immigration certificates. The transfer of a certain number of refugees from Europe to Palestine will not solve the political question of the existence and independence of the Jewish people. We shall not accept the status of a minority in our land, whether the minority is 33% or 49%. We know what has happened to the Assyrians in Iraq, and we are aware of the lot of the Jewish minorities in the Arab states today. We shall not accept the symbolic independence in a dwarf-like token state which will not give us the chance of developing all the resources of the country and creating here a safe asylum for all Jews who are compelled or wish to come. A half-hearted compromise on the Palestinian question can only lead to disaster. It will not solve the Jewish problem. This final statement uh, at the end. The Jews are a nation. The land of Israel belongs to the people of Israel. The Jewish state will be established. It is better that it should be established with your help for, and for your benefit than against you. The word genocide now, getting back to the purpose of the book, was to find out if the original intent, which was promulgated here in 42, 44, 46, 40, uh, 45, and 46, in fact, is what was intended and what the British thought was supposed to be intended when they came to the uh, authority vested in them by the League of Nations and later by the United Nations. This report by the High Commissioner, Harold McMichael, 
and it's listed as most secret, and it's written in 1941, uh, sent to the Secretary of State. And in this piece, he um, speaks about the consequences of what he is faced with in a, a country where, in the mandate country that he's overseeing, where the control uh, of the Majesty's government is being threatened. Um, and he be, makes reference to the, the Balfour Declaration, but he makes reference to it in such a way that it is different in uh, kind than what we ordinarily think of as the, um, as the Balfour Declaration. Let me read to you um, this piece from the Avalon Project at Yale University which describes uh, the Balfour Declaration and its intent. Quote, unauthorized statesmen, statements have been made to the effect that the purpose in view is to create a holy Jewish Palestine. His Majesty's government regard any such expectation as impracticable and have no such aim in view, nor have they at any time contemplated the disappearance or the subordination of the Arabic population, language, or culture in Palestine. They would draw attention to the fact that the terms of the Balfour Declaration referred to do not contemplate that Palestine as a whole should be converted into a Jewish national home, but that such a home should be founded in Palestine. His Majesty's government therefore now declare unequivocally that it is not part of their policy that Palestine should become a Jewish state. Now this, it seems to me, is pretty clear, and it means that the Jewish, uh, the mandate government has authority for both people to bring the Jewish people in so that that homeland can be established, but at the same time to make sure that the indigenous population is cared for and their culture and bodies protected. This became an impossibility. What they ended up doing, obviously, was to hand that dilemma over to the UN. It produces, in 1947, November, the partition plan. That gave 55% of the mandate area to the Jews and 45% to the Palestinians. Now, what then is genocide? And what authority do you go to to find out what genocide is? The book goes to Raphael Lemkin's definition. His study was of what happened to the Jewish population in Nazi Germany. What he found was that it was the way in which the Nazis treated the Jews had implications across the board for any population that might try to uh, impact another, either by occupation, oppression, or removal of people. And so he wrote up a definition and created a word, genocide. It became, in 1948, the UN uh, articles on what genocide is. Now, uh, if I read uh, two things, let me read two things to you here. One is a description uh, that is put together by Frank Chalk and Kurt Johannesson, summarizing what Lemkin's definition uh, means. Under Lemkin's definition, genocide was the coordinated and planned annihilation of a national, religious, or re racial group by a variety of actions aimed at undermining the foundations essential to the survival of the group as a group. Lemkin conceived of genocide as a composite of different acts of persecution or destruction. His definition included attacks on political and social institutions, culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of the group. Even non-lethal acts that undermine the liberty, dignity, and personal security of members of a group constituted genocide if they contributed to weakening the viability of the group. Under Lemkin's definition, acts of ethnocide 
a term coined by the French after the war to cover the destruction of a culture without the killing of its bearers, also qualified as genocide. Now that's the overall understanding synopsized. When it was brought into two articles in the United Nations to define genocide, it takes on for Article 2, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethical, racial, or religious group as such. A, killing members of the group. B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And then Article 3, the following acts shall be punishable. A, genocide. B, conspiracy to commit genocide. C, direct and public incitement to commit genocide. D, attempt to commit genocide. And E, complicity in genocide. Now, what that uh, understanding does is to put into context a way of evaluating and assessing the conditions that exist in a situation similar to what we have in Palestine. When we began, the map of Palestine was roughly 94% uh, indigenous population. And it's quite clear that uh, the Jews at this point early on began prior to the mandate with 6% of the land that they owned. And subsequently, when you get into 1939, uh, with the immigration coming in, uh, now you're looking at roughly 30%. Uh, percent. So the population was obviously heavily uh, indigenous, Arabic, and Palestinian. It got to the point in 1939 that the British Mandate Authority realized we can't absorb the numbers that are coming in and maintain a relationship of the indigenous population versus the newcomers coming in. And if you look at uh, the maps that are in all that remains, you realize that the Jewish population have been concentrated in about two major cities, uh, what Tel Aviv and Haifa, uh, and a smaller group in Jerusalem. And throughout the rest of Mandate Palestine, there was relatively a handful. What they ended up doing when they brought these people in was to set up a, a, a government working with the British called the Jewish Agency. And the Jewish Agency uh, consisted of a person responsible for jobs uh, with Hidradath and uh, education, uh, dealing with uh, economics and tax revenues. Each one of these men uh, worked on behalf of the Jewish Agency, ostensibly as a cooperative government, so that people coming in would have a home to live in or a building to live in and have a job available to them and have their children have education available to them, all of which is very beneficial. And the British understood that and thought that they were working with a group that in fact wanted to cooperate with the British. As it turns out, and this is what they found when Sir Richard Catling and his group went out and seized documents from the Jewish agency, Haganah, uh, the military wing, Irgan and Stern gangs, uh, all of which were a military force. And when they seized these documents, they found evidence that there was a clandestine government. And what that means is that those same people that were operating and working with the British on immigration knew what the British people or the government was intending to do, how many they would allow in. They had no intentions of not allowing everyone in if they could get them. So there was an odds going on here as, as the numbers increased. In 1939, the British uh, promulgated a white paper and that white paper put a limit on the number of immigrants allowed in, and immediately the Zionist group saw itself at war with the Mandate people. Uh, McMichael, the High Commissioner, in 1941, writes, and it's quoted here, 
to the British government, to the Secretary of State, we are faced with a military force here that is superior, not just to the Arabs, but to any attempt to control it. And not only that, but we have a political situation where the sympathy for the Jewish cause back home is incredibly great, and therefore anything we try to do to corral the policies we should be implementing is not going to work. Now, what kind of numbers? Back in 41, 42, they were looking at 20 to 80,000, and within uh, 45, 46, we're looking upwards of 200,000. These are trained, experienced military. None of that, of course, is um, explained openly to the mandate forces. Now, all through this evidence, the violence that was being used against the British uh, is what we call terrorists, and that's what they called, uh, the, what the British called the Jews there, the Zionists. They were terrorists. They blew up bridges. They uh, bombed the King David Hotel. 91 people killed. It was a false flag operation. They went into the basement with canisters of um, apparently milk filled with bomb materials and blew it up. They kidnapped two British soldiers, hung them, booby-trapped their bodies so when they were taken down, those taking their bodies down were blown up as well. This was violence of a kind that the British Mandate Authority didn't have the personnel at this point in time to deal with uh, or the backing of what Catling calls the three-legged stool. You need the government behind you, you need your military, and you need the people. And he was missing the government back home. And so they were faced with a dilemma, and they could not carry out the mandate. And so they had to hand it over to the UN. Now, the issue then is, well, when Israel declared its independence, it was on May 14, fascinating thing that on that week before May 14, advertisements appeared in New York papers and elsewhere in the U.S. trying to convince the American people of the necessity of their president for all humanity and for peace in the Mideast to accept, recognize the state of Israel, which will be declared on May 14. That day, Truman got a letter from the agency and a backup support from the Nations Association telling him how significant this action had to be, but it went further and said, what you would be recognizing is a state that has accepted the United Nations uh, partition so that we have our homeland and we will abide by the law and be, bring peace uh, to the area and at the same time care for the people that are uh, there uh, already. A month and five days before that May 14th deadline, they attacked the town of Deir Yassin. And that town became the first of about 20 different massacres that are corroborated and identified by both Elam Papi and Benny Morris in their histories of this period, based on the sunlight uh, availability of uh, heretofore secret documents coming out of the Jewish agency in Haganah, and saying in effect that this was necessary because you had to get rid of the Arab people in order to maintain a Jewish state. Benny Morris simply said they should have gotten rid of all of them uh, during that period and then it wouldn't be an issue. But they left about 20% of the people uh, in what uh, Israel became. And Israel was attacking not only Deir Yassin but a number of others were actually uh, depopulated before the British left the, the Mandate area and before they declared the independence. So there's a, 
hiding of the reality of what they called peace from the president and from the American people. That kind of deception is at the root of how the Zionist group worked in uh, this period in Mandate uh, Palestine. It seems to me that that is genocidal. If you look at the definition, which they became a signature to, that is, once Israel was accepted uh, by the United States, it signed into being a member of the UN and therefore should have abided by its uh, understanding of what genocide is all about. the formation of the Jewish state done through deceit. That is to say, it went to the UN, it went to the United States, it went to the American people, and it proclaimed one thing while it was, in fact, eradicating, wiping off the map, bulldozing down to nothing, almost 418 towns and villages, leaving a couple of them still standing, which are now inhabited, obviously, by Jewish uh, people. That, to me, is breaking international law. Yet, once it was recognized by the United States, for some reason, it automatically becomes legitimate. Well, let's assume it was legitimate. So now we come forward and you look at the conditions that prevail at the present time, and we have just witnessed, and here's proof of it right there in that book, in 32 chapters, that they have committed crimes against humanity. The governments of Israel, in conjunction with the governments of the United States. What is the issue now when you look at this and realize that if you go to the maps through confiscation and through forced purchase and through politics uh, and legal status, all of the land essentially with the exception of what amounts to 12% is now in the hands of the Israeli government. Now that alone seems to suggest a real problem relative to wiping the people off the map, if you like. Now, can you bolster that with other issues? And if you were today to go to the government of Israel and the Likud government, it has as policy that there will not be a Palestinian state west of Jordan. That's policy. That's wiping it off before it even gets negotiated. That, it seems to me, is much more stringent and an active uh, removal of the land that the people live on and had lived on for over 1,800 years. But that's not alone what we're talking about. We're also looking at, did they have any intent whatsoever of negotiating and having a peace uh, plan to bring forward? Reality is, and one of the chapters in the book is that of Jeff Halper, and for 55 pages he itemizes step by step and fact by fact the problem with Israel. And the problem is they do not intend and they have not intended to come to a two-state solution. This is not in their plan. Now, this situation has gotten worse over time, including to today. Now, genocide is defined here. The only way you can arrive at genocide, other than to see the definition, look at the facts that are present on the ground and everywhere else, and realize if this were brought to an international court, if it were brought through the United Nations Human Rights Council for Judgment, would genocide apply? Let's take the Goldstone Report. Uh, after the Operation Cast Lead, where Israel invaded Gaza. And in doing so, a Goldstone Report comes out which states crimes against humanity. What it was asking for is that this be brought before the Human Rights Council and the international courts. The United States vetoes it, as it has vetoed 80 other prior Security Council resolutions related to 
asking that actions done by Israel are in fact brought before the court system so that if there's validity in this definition of genocide, we can see it. It can be acted upon. The United States has prevented that. It does not allow Israel to be brought up for any criticism whatsoever, even though 170 or more nations at a time will vote that uh, resolution into place. In other words, we become the means by which no action and immunity for Israel is maintained. That, it seems to me, it becomes an issue if you want to find out why genocide is in this book. This book is determined to show what genocide means and to show you with more than 20 worldwide authors how that definition applies to the occupation of Palestine, whether it's uh, Chris Hedges or it's a Yuri Avnery or it's a Francis Boyle, all these writers who are looking at actions taking place are looking at it and seeing their genocide. Now, some would say, well, you can't use that word because it hasn't been proven. Well, it hasn't been proven because Israel controls the voice in America in its Congress and its Senate almost unanimously. Uh, just plain human sense would suggest to you that maybe there are differences of opinion on certain matters, but not when it comes to Israel. And therefore, we are complicit. That's one of the acts of genocide, to be complicit in this. U.S. is complicit in this. All right. Now, if you want to condemn the book or condemn the editor of the book or condemn all the writers in the book who have dealt with this concept of genocide, then I would urge that we bring genocide before the courts and say, is it or is it not? And then judge the book.